Good afternoon. I am really happy to be here. Thank you, Hudson. And thank you, Councilman Nirenberg, for inviting me to participate. It's good to be back out here in District 8, other than at a budget meeting. So uh, I'm rather impressed that so many of you are here. We're competing with some pretty nice weather this afternoon, but it's so great to be here at Hardberger Park. Uh, Betty Sutherland and I, before this started, were just reminiscing about working on the acquisition of this property 10 years ago and then working on the 2007 bond program to have some funds available to be able to build this ecology center with the help of the community. And what a wonderful, wonderful asset this, this great park is. So we're really pleased to be here this afternoon. So I do want to thank uh, Councilman Nirenberg for inviting me. I'm going to use some notes because he told me I had five minutes and nothing more than that. So I, I want to be quick so we can get on to your work session. But personally for me, it is always an op opportunity and a pleasure to be here uh, with you. So what I thought I'd do is just quickly three things this afternoon in my comments. First. Uh, to talk with you a little bit um, in an overview about what we will embark on with our comprehensive plan uh, for the city. Secondly, a little bit about the, some major capital improvement projects that are happening here in District 8. And then thirdly, introduce our chief of police, our interim chief of police, uh, Tony Trevino, who's here, and tell you a little bit about our search process. So let me begin by talking just for a few minutes about our comprehensive plan. As you know, we're embarking on a rather ambitious uh, urban planning endeavor, and uh, this is an update of our comprehensive plan, and that hasn't happened for over 20 years, so we're excited to be able to have this opportunity to uh, uh, update that plan. And as you know, Councilman Nirenberg chairs the comprehensive planning committee of the city council, so uh, this district will have a big role in that process. And according to our Texas state demographer, Bear County will grow by at least 1.1 million new residents by the year 2040, with more than half of that growth expected within the city limits. One million more people means 500,000 more homes, 500,000 more jobs, and lots more cars. So we have a lot of work to do. And the pressures projected population growth uh, necessitates a thorough uh, review and update of our city policies, not only the planning of how we want the city to grow, but also the policies related to our comprehensive plan, how, wh how and where we want to see that growth, uh, updating our transportation plan, as well as our sustainability. What can we do to protect the environment as part of the growth? So the city looks forward to collaborating with all sectors of the community to make this incredible endeavor happen. And a sustainable public engagement campaign is currently being developed. And uh, this is to ensure that the entire community is engaged in the conversation about how we grow in an authentic manner and also one that uh, is appropriate for San Antonio. So some of the things that the public engagement will include are uh, youth town hall meetings, because we want those people who will be living, working, earning, educating in the community in the year 2040, when we have one million more people here in Bear County to be at the table with us, helping us plan the community. There's also a go where they are, engagement with residents, and it is a program to make sure we get out into the community and talk with not those of us who attend all of these kinds of meetings regularly, but to reach everyone in the community and get their input. Also, neighborhood association workshops and aggressive use of today's social media. So we'll be using all of these avenues, and I encourage you to participate in some of the many opportunities that will shape San Antonio in the year 2040. And a community-wide kickoff event will take place on Saturday, April 11th, at the Alamo Convocation Center beginning at 10 a.m., and I hope we'll see you there. Now, just a comment about annexation. As our community addresses the substantial growth, we also have to review our annexation policies. And John Dugan, our planning director, is here, and he's going to talk with you in just a, a few minutes. But annexation projects for future development 
by existing zoning and public health safety codes facilitates long-range planning and promotes economic growth, good annexation planning, ensures that our city grows in an orderly fashion. And we've spent quite a bit of time uh, over the past year and a half studying uh, different areas of the city and whether or not it's appropriate and whether or not the community desires to annex these areas to become a part of the city. Uh, San Antonio's annexation program identifies areas where the city may choose to initiate further annexations, estimate phasing of the annexations, and provide projections uh, for the next 10 years. And on December 4th, 2014, the city council asked staff to initiate planning studies for five priority areas. And the first three areas that will be completed this December of 2015 are out I-10 to the west, so northwest of us, up, up 281 to the north, and then I-10 to the east. There are three areas identified. John will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, then in 2016, we'll take a look at two further annexation areas, one out around uh, Highway 151 on the far west side, and then US 90 and 1604. So there are areas that are being studied, and this was at the policy direction of the City Council to take a look at those areas adjacent to the city limits and whether or not they should be considered for annexation to the city. These areas total over 66 square miles, the five areas that I identified that the council has given us direction to proceed and to study those areas for annexation. And they have a current, those areas have a current population of 117,000 people, and we expect those areas to grow as well. So uh, much work in that area, and we'll look for your input as well. Initial annexation will extend building and safety codes for a period of three years, and then council may annex the areas for full purposes by the end of the third year. The annexation process uh, takes several years, but uh, that is what we're working on right now. It's important to retain Annexation is important to retain the city's economic competitiveness in the region, facilitate long-range planning, and will ensure a higher quality of development. So um, you'll hear much more about that work in the upcoming months. Uh, secondly, some construction activity, and uh, I think we all have seen what's going on in this district. As you know, the 2012 bond program was approved by the voters. Uh, almost uh, three years ago, and this program encompasses 140 different projects throughout all of San Antonio. Its, its total cost is about $600 million, and it was, of course, all voter approved. Most of those projects are focused on street improvements, drainage improvements, and park development for the city. There are some buildings that are funded, but it's mostly about streets, drainage, and park. So let me take a moment just to highlight three construction projects. Hausman Road, Interstate 10, that happens to be a state project, but I want to give you an update on the schedule for that. Uh, and De Zavala from the railroad tracks uh, north to Lock Hill Selma, a project that Councilman Nirenberg asked us to uh, embark on. So Hausman Road, and as you know, that's from Loop 1604 to I-10, three miles, a little over three miles, and we partnered with the county. They have some bridge work, some creek work, uh, where they were going to do some drainage, so we're all working together on that project. In total, with the city and the county, $72 million project. It's the single largest uh, roadway project that we have ever undertaken. It's the first road rate, roadway project for utilizing what we call design build, where the designers and the contractors are working under one contract to streamline and make sure that there's not a gap between the design and the construction of the road. Because sometimes what happens, the road is designed, someone else comes in to, to construct the road, and then they point fingers over, well, you didn't tell me this was here, or we need to redo this. When they're working under one contract, there is one supervisor that's ensuring the project gets done well. So you know it's under construction, and the section of the loop from 1604 to Road, road runner way is scheduled to be complete and open to the public August of 15 and it will uh, that's right before school so uh, Peter Zanoni deputy manager who's here who's over our transportation and capital improvements project 
Peter, wave your hand so they know who to go to if this project is not completed before school starts. Uh, we're working with the contractor and we do want to make sure that we get this done and uh, Peter's a really tough taskmaster so I'm, I'm confident he's going to be able to uh, ensure that we're done on time and he'll keep track of it along the way. And then the remaining section, uh, 2I10, will be completed by December of 2015, uh, right before Christmas. So we're excited. This project's been long in the making. You may recall we had the engineering and design in the last bond program and then the actual dollars for construction in the 2012 program. So thank you for voting uh, the approval of that. Lots of pain during construction, but once it's done, it will be um, a great addition for the community with turning lanes at the intersections and widened and sidewalks on the north side of the roadway. So it'll be great. Uh, and then uh, I-10 uh, from 1604 to Hebner, a uh, couple of facts regarding this project. Tech Stock's $44 million expansion project is to relieve congestion along I-10 between Loop 1604 and Hebner. And the project scope is huge, including the addition of one main lane in each direction on I-10, a turnaround at UTSA uh, for <coughs> eastbound traffic in the elimination of an on-ramp at Hebner Oaks and an off-ramp at De Zavala. So the project is estimated to be completed by June this summer, June of 15, and to help with the traffic congestion, TxDOT anticipates uh, to reopen the closed lanes and the turnaround at De Zavala by mid-March, so we're going to stay on top of them. Uh, to try to see that that happens. The city has also made some signal timing adjustments along key intersections at De Zavala, Hebner, and Wurzbach throughout the construction. And Peter can uh, affirm that I'm one of the biggest critics uh, when it comes to our street construction and TxDOT. Uh, when we drive through, all of us are on alert to make sure and to manage and take a look at it and then to give feedback to TxDOT and our own engineers so that we can facilitate and do a the best job possible during construction. So we're open to more suggestions today if you have some other ideas on that or want to give us some feedback, we welcome that so that we can continue to make improvements. And then thirdly, De Zavala from the railroad, as I said, to Lock Hill Selma. Here's a couple of facts about that project. 17.7 million, uh, 3 million currently funded for the design. Uh, and so the city is funding uh, that design. Councilman Nirenberg has asked us to uh, do our best to see if we can get some construction dollars. We expect that we'll be requesting that at a minimum in the 2017 bond program, but if other dollars become available for street construction before that, we'll be taking a recommendation to council for that. And as you know, it includes widening the road and adding sidewalks as well. So um, that design is anticipated to be completed by the end of this calendar year. So we'll be positioned to uh, go forward with that. And then the third thing I wanted to just uh, talk with you a little bit about today, as you know, Police Chief McManus uh, recently retired from his law enforcement career. He worked in law enforcement for over 40 years and a uh, very distinguished career, and we're very pleased uh, that and fortunate that he was our chief for the past nine years. He was one of the first department heads that I recruited and appointed as uh, the new city manager back in 2005. He was appointed in early 2006, and today the San Antonio Police Department is better managed, more professional, and has better trained officer than ever in its history, and we thank Chief McManus for that leadership and his great work. And to continue and maintain this positive momentum, uh, I've appointed Deputy Chief Anthony Trevino to serve as interim, interim chief. And I know you know Chief Trevino. He was here, and I saw him talking with many of you before the meeting began. He's a San Antonio native, has over 20 years of law enforcement experience in the San Antonio Police Department, and has held various leadership positions. In addition to his recent role, most recent role before being appointed interim chief. He served as head of our internal affairs division and served in the community services unit 
providing leadership and guidance for the San Antonio Fear-Free Environment, our SAFE program, which furthers the police department's relationship with neighborhood and community stakeholders, which is so important, uh, not just uh, responding to calls for service, but working in a proactive way with all of you. He was also instrumental in the implementation of the patrol resource allocation model. We call that PRAM for short, but that was about reallocating our resources where the needs are the greatest and where we have growing populations. So he led uh, that effort. I look forward to working with him and our entire police department to continue providing high quality public safety services to the community. Uh, the appointment of the next police chief is one of my most important responsibilities. That is one of the most important positions in our city government. And uh, you may recall that back in 2000, late 2005, when I began working with the city of San Antonio in early 2006, not only did we look at our applications, those internal to the department and those external to the department applying for chief, but we engaged the community. And I invited about 30 individuals from all walks of life throughout the community to serve on three community panels and to meet those candidates for the position and to provide input, not to select the chief, but to tell me from their vantage point the strengths and weaknesses of the candidates and what they thought we needed in our police chief. So we're going to engage a similar process and I know that Chief Trevino is going to be one of the applicants as well and he's doing a great job so I encourage you to get to know him and uh, to work with him. And we'll look for representatives from District 8 to be on those community panels as well. So uh, I'm excited for that process. And as I said, it's one of the most important positions with the city. So as you can see in conclusion, there's significant activity going on throughout the city. You um, know that through Councilman Nirenberg of the many, many projects and policy issues that he is leading as a member of the city council and also that we're contemplating uh, for our community. We're trying to position ourselves as a front runner among our US cities in terms of our managed growth and development and also in job creation for the community to help businesses here grow and prosper and also to attract jobs to the community that are 21st century jobs uh, that all can benefit from. So thank you again, and to Councilman Nirenberg, thank you for your outstanding leadership and support. We enjoy working with you. Have a great afternoon, and we look forward to talking with you during the table discussions. At this time, I'd like to introduce Chief Trevino to come up and to uh, share a few words with you this afternoon. Chief? Hey, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody out here. I, I might be dating myself a little bit, but I remember when I was a kid, uh, I, I was uh, deer hunting at one point in time where De Zavala, distant side 1604 is. So like it or not, growth is coming to San Antonio. And I think uh, as a community, as a city, we have to manage it. And I think uh, the manager is doing a, a great job of looking out for that future growth. And like I said, like it or not, it's going to be coming. And one of the things that I've always truly loved about San Antonio, it's a big city that doesn't know it's a big city yet. And uh, that's one of the things that really makes San Antonio a truly unique place to live and work. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're doing in recognition of that is we are becoming a big city. We are a big city. We're seventh, and I think there's some projections that we're going to move up uh, within the next few years on that scale. But uh, one of the things that uh, we did early on as, uh, as I took office in January is uh, we went citywide with a, a program called Nextdoor. Who here is, on, is already logged into Nextdoor? Who's part of that? If you're not, you need to get involved in it. It's, it's really a good program. And what it, it's, a, it's an outreach, but really it's a, utilizing social media to tie communities together because that's what, uh, what it's all about. Because strong communities create a strong city. And so what the, uh, what the Nextdoor platform allows you to do, uh, you, can, you can log in and you get to know everything that's going on within your community. You can put things such as, you know, lost dog, bake sale, garage sales going on in the neighborhood, but then also community type events that maybe aren't so positive, but you need to be aware of, such as crime prevention tips that our safe officers are putting out. So it's a great platform. And so if you're not on Nextdoor yet, I encourage you to, to uh, utilize it. It's something that, again, it's about trying to create stronger communities because again those stronger communities are going to create a, a better environment for us 
And then one of the things that uh, prior to becoming a, a chief is uh, I was the chief of staff for the department. And so one of the big pushes that I, that I made is rec the re uh, recognizing the fact that society and the way that we're communicating is changing. And so one of the things that, uh, that I've made a hard push for us to do is to make sure that we're more active in the social media because we, we put stuff out through the news, we can put stuff out through newspapers, but it's not, it's not the most effective way in some instances to put the word out. And so a lot of what we're doing organizationally, we put that information out through our SAPD Facebook. And then when I took office in January, we also put out that information in Spanish also. And, uh, but our, uh, our followers on uh, our SAPD Facebook, we have over uh, almost uh, 85,000 followers. And so that puts us number one in the state of Texas. I mean, we're bigger than Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin. And think about it. I mean, uh, and I think that puts us probably about fourth overall in the nation. So I think that's a big success. But part of that is people engaged in that and actually following what we're doing uh, within the community. And so that's that's a great resource that I encourage you all to uh, to uh, to tie into if you have that opportunity. And one other thing, another thing that we did most recently is we had our first coffee with the cops event over off of uh, Houston and uh, IH10. And that's a great opportunity for members of the community to get to meet not only the uh, the officers, the safe officers that a lot of y'all already know that are working within your communities, but to know the line level officers that are answering the calls for service within your community. And so we're going to be bringing that out to different areas of town. And it's important because when I introduced everybody uh, from the officer all the way up to command level uh, positions, I, I uh, introduced them as your officer. And so because that's truly what they are. They're your officer serving your community. And so uh, it's not like in the old days where uh, there was an officer that was walking a footbeat that everybody knew who your officer was that was working in the area. Now things are changed. We have officers that go uh, and work larger service areas and patrol cars that the only time you're going to see them, unfortunately, is when bad things happen a lot of times. But so we wanted to create a positive environment where members of the community get to meet their officers that are patrolling their streets day and night and uh, all the way up to the station commander and the division commanders within the department. So it's a good opportunity, and so uh, we'll be putting that out, and uh, I encourage uh, some, some great participation from the program. We had our first event, and we didn't know if we are going to have five people show up or 50 people show up, and I think we had about 65 uh, people show up, and it was a really good, positive event, and it was very well received. And then one of the final things that I want to talk about this afternoon is... Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I tell the officers all the time when I go out to, to roll calls is that uh, people's perception of us as an organization, maybe the chief of police, formerly Chief McManus or myself, doing a soundbite or, or coming out and doing an event such as like, uh, like this, that may be people's perception of who we are as an organization. But what I'm stressing to the officers is you are that level where our reality is formed with the, with the community. And so... The bottom line, what we're talking about in justice-based policing is about treating people with dignity because that's what people will fight you for and that's what, what is most important to people, what people covet. And so we need to teach officers to make sure that we're communicating with the, the citizens that we serve and protect every day in the, in the right way. And nine out of 10 officers do it in the absolutely perfect way and we're very proud of all that. But there's always room for improvement. And so we're seeking this opportunity to go through the justice-based policing curriculum to make sure that we're 10 out of 10. Because again, the, those relationships are formed at, with the line level officers and those day-to-day -day engagements with the members of the community. And because if we have a strong relationship with the community, that makes all the difference in the world because our relationship with the community needs to be based upon a foundation of trust. And so we form that foundation of trust in those one-on-one -on -one individual engagements with members of the community. So again, uh, I am humbled and honored by the opportunity to at least be your interim chief for now and uh, appreciate the opportunity, uh, manager. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I think uh, your councilman is going to be coming up next, but uh, he's a great councilman to work with as, and has always been very supportive of public safety. So councilman, thank you. Thank you, Chief. I am not the councilman, but um, this event is billed as Ron's State of the District Address, but it's first and foremost, and he's reminded me of this several times, a community planning 
session. Uh, and with the comprehensive plan we've just undertaken, meetings like this are all that more important. Uh, truly, the success of this plan hinges on the quality of the public input we receive. And so I'm going to uh, pass things off to someone who can speak far more intelligently than I can about all things planning, the director of our city's planning department, John Dugan. We need a little aid here. Hello, everybody. As we get the slideshow going, I'm Sean Dugan. I'm director of planning for the city. And we have a real exciting planning program that's underway that you all get to be involved in, and the whole city does. It doesn't happen but once every 10 or 20 years. But we're going to be talking about what is comprehensive planning here and talk about how we're going to do our comprehensive plan for San Antonio. As the city manager said, comprehensive planning is about accommodating and distributing growth. We're going to have this huge amount of growth, and it's going to help the council and all of us guide our strategic decision making about transportation and where we put new roads and where future growth is going to take place, and help us guide our infrastructure in terms of investments. Now, when we talk about a, a comprehensive plan for a city, we're talking about really some policies for the city council is what it really boils down to, about what we're going to do, what the city council thinks the community could do, what we're going to do with billions of dollars worth of city funds over the next generation. And we're going to look at these different uh, areas here to focus in on in terms of what we call plan elements, or focus areas of policy. And these call are covering the areas of growth and urban form, transportation and connectivity about all of our roads and, and transit, Housing, there's a huge affordable housing issue here, but, you know, both in the inner city and developing on the edge of the city. The green and healthy neighborhoods, how we can build new sustainable neighborhoods that are healthy and people can get food, walk to work perhaps. New public facilities and safety, as Chief just talked about, how those all interrelate. Our natural resources and our environment, we've got air quality issues and water quality and quantity issues. Historic preservation that makes San Antonio unique as a city. Our huge military presence and all the retirees, our jobs and our, our emphasis on economic competitiveness and growing the city, the sustainability overall so that we don't make any big mistakes here that would really destroy the future for our kids and grandkids. And, and then how do we put this into law? How do we codify all these ideas, these policies, to be sure they are implemented and we're not just wasting our time? So this is what the plan is going to be really focused on. These different groups are going to start working in March, and we're going to work for about two or three months and come back with some drafts as to what the future should be in terms of all these areas. And then we're going to start having a dialogue with the public, with you and all the different publics across the city as the manager laid out with all those different kinds of media. Now, we're not doing this just on our own, and this isn't just a new thing. A lot of cities across the country have been doing comprehensive planning for a long time, and particularly recently in Texas, with the huge growth in Texas, our major cities have also been doing comprehensive plans to guide the way, to have a blueprint, to be able to choose and prioritize resources. Austin in 2012, as well as El Paso, Houston's in process, their very first comprehensive plan. Um, they actually decided they actually needed to have a guide to where to go. They're getting lost there. Uh, Philadelphia a few years ago, Denver, Cincinnati, all of the major, major cities in the country are laying out new comprehensive plans and guides for their future. So why are we doing this now? Well, we've got some big challenges here for growth. Look at that, that line projection there. That's what we perceive to be the population growth just based upon experience in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. Not really assuming we grow faster than we did in the past, just the same rate, 1.8% per year, that's about half of that natural demographic increase, births over deaths, and the other half, people coming here for jobs. If our job initiatives are successful, that line's going to happen. That shows 3 million people in Bear County. Now, I don't know how much of Bear County is going to be in San Antonio by then, but a good portion of it. So if that happens, we're talking about a city larger than Chicago and almost as big as Los Angeles in population. So. It's a big challenge, and we have to be ready to anticipate that. So how is this city going to grow? That's the big $64,000 question. Uh, if we keep growing the way we've been growing, we're going to have a suburban sprawl like Stone Oak all the way to San Marcos. And that could happen. Uh, there's not really any big barriers there except a few little towns. There's a better way to grow, and it's called smarter growth. Um, and it's what it's in our vision for the city, the 2020 vision that the community adopted several years ago when Mayor Castro 
was really focusing on what should we do to become a great world-class city and how should we grow. One of the key themes of that was to focus as much growth as we could within the existing footprint of the city, using existing utilities, existing infrastructure, existing roads and parks, et cetera, and not have to duplicate it and replicate it more expensively on the edge of the city. That's what we term in planning parlance smart growth. And I'm not saying it's the other kind of growth is dumb, but this, this is smarter. And if we do that, we've done a big study of all the vacant land in Bear County, including San Antonio, and found 70,000 vacant and underutilized parcels. That's a lot. And that's enough to hold, and this map shows here, 22% of new units, maybe 100,000 could go within 410 if we do it right and plan it carefully. Another 23% or another 100,000 units between 410 and 1604 in the neighborhoods not too far from here. And then to the south and to the north beyond 1604, that would be where about half the growth would have to take place and we'll have to consider annexing property so that that property is within the city and it can be managed and zoned correctly. So let's look a little bit on the inner city here. Um, nationally, there's a growing preference you know, for home buyers to live in walkable mixed-use communities. Uh, surveys have shown that about half the U.S. population, in fact, would like to be in one. They didn't have to take a car everywhere to do everything. And unfortunately, though, only 50 of San Antonio's over 380 communities are walkable, according to national walk score assessments. And that map shows that they're almost all within 410, and they're almost all just around the old part of the city downtown around the Riverwalk and just north of the Riverwalk and the, around the Pearl District. So we got a lot of ways to go there in terms of creating new walkable communities. But when you think about incorporating four or 500,000 more people within the existing footprint of the city, you might want to know where could these people go? Well, another study we've done shows that frankly almost all of, over half the growth in the last two decades in the city have been only in eight areas and we call these activity centers or employment centers and they're about areas you know about like around UTSA, around the medical center in Stone Oak, around the airport, Sam Houston, around Port Sam Houston, around downtown Port San Antonio. Hundreds of thousands of new jobs have focused in on these areas and there's a few areas that are emerging and shown in blue there like around Rolling Oaks Mall up on 1604 near 35 and out toward the west around you know, 151 and 1604 near Alamo Ranch and down south by the new Texas A&M campus. Also brick space. These are areas that also could accommodate a whole lot of growth. So what we're trying to do is find places within the city where we can accommodate growth, plan for growth, but not impact the existing neighborhoods, which need to be preserved, protected, and fostered. So this is one way to do it, and this is the best practice way to do it. So let's just focus in a little more on District 8. Here we've got two of those growth centers, and these are just generalized boundaries. These aren't, aren't specific yet. We plan, need to do, and we will do more detailed planning for all of these growth centers. But the medical center really covers about 4,000 acres, and there's 63,000 people working there. Uh, I know some of the medical center um, management would like that to expand quite a bit, maybe 10, 20, 30,000 more jobs. There's 300 vacant acres there. There's a lot of vacant land adjacent nearby. UTSA covers twice that size and has over 18,000 people working there, plus all the students. So there's a huge concentration of people, and as you know, you live around here, you know how the traffic's like every day. I drive through here every day, and uh, it could be better, and it's going to get worse with all this growth, particularly with the improvements to Interstate 10, widening the road with managed lanes. So that's why, as the manager said, we've looked really carefully and are recommending that we annex all the land on about a mile on each side of I-10 all the way up to Bernie. And that we incorporate that into the city limits in the next three years and do more zone the property, because it's not even zoned yet, and manage the growth around the new interchanges and expanded frontage roads that are going to be constructed there along I-10. And then look carefully at all the vacant parcels in here, particularly around UTSA and the medical center, for a careful infill development to accommodate some of the growth. We really have three growth plans um that we're wait a minute there we go that we're working on right now this comprehensive plan i'm talking about is also a, a big sustainability plan to look at air quality and resiliency issues and we're looking at a transportation plan that will see how could we link up all these growth centers and provide alternative modes of transportation more choices for people to get around the city than the car 
Uh, I used to be planning uh, director in Los Angeles, and I tell you, when you only have a car, uh, that's not a very good choice. You gotta have some more. You have to have many different options to be able to get around in a really big city. So if, in conclusion, we're not gonna do this alone. This isn't an ivory tower exercise. This is a real engagement process. You know, we really need to talk to um, you all. And so we are going to have a process here, uh, public engagement, that's what it says across the top there, over the next year. And we're going to be, right now, working on these studies that I mentioned to you, and any of you can access those studies as we post them online when they get finished. Uh, April, May, June, we're going to be talking about writing up where are we now, what's the existing conditions, what are the issues, how are we going to model the transportation for all this growth, what's the air quality options that we have to improve our air quality. During the uh, summer and into the fall, we're going to be doing some real outreach to all you and the communities and the engagement, tell you some things, listening back and forth, back and forth over all these different social media, and begin coming up with our draft plans and our draft needs assessment for where growth could take place and how to do it sustainably. By the fall and early winter, we'll have some draft planning work done and talk about priorities and talk about an overall sustainability plan where we can then uh, get your feedback on that as well. And we hope about a year from now, uh, in the spring of 2016, the final documents will go for, for public hearings. Um, we'll have reviews in each district and then go to the Planning Commission and City Council. And hopefully, next spring, we'll have a brand new city plan, a guide and a blueprint for the next generation or so. So those are our contact uh, numbers and addresses if you want to address us with sanantonio.gov planning. We're going to be posting all these uh, ideas up on a new web page for planning uh, next month and look forward to your engagement. Now, I could take a couple questions, but I also, after I have any questions you might have, that's your place. There's a page, a white page there uh, with some questions, four of them, about what you might think about the future, because we want to start hearing from you. This is a plan for your city, and we want to know what you want to do. So uh, if you would like to just take a few minutes and jot down some ideas there, afterward we'll have staff come and pick those up, and I'll read a few of the answers that, uh, that you all want to give back to us. So you can start answering those questions, or you can ask and or ask me some questions now. Uh, while you're working on those. Any questions about our plans? Your plans? Okay, all right, then I want to hear from you. See if you can um, fill those out, and then we'll uh, talk about those for a few minutes. Thank you. Yes, sir, you got a question? Sure. Um, yeah, there's three other big modes that other cities have, bigger cities. One's a better transportation system in terms of transit, in terms of bus rapid transit and light rail. Uh, Houston's got an extensive light rail system, and Dallas has, has a very sophisticated one, the biggest one in the country right now. Uh, we can look at as models. Also pedestrian access along our stream valleys and connecting up our parks even to a much more sophisticated level than we have now. And then bicycle options, uh, connecting up things with good bicycle pathway systems and, and hopefully more class one bikes which are off-road. Uh, that's expensive but that's safer and that gives another option for people. So looking at all the modes, so the, and then there's rail, um, commuter rail as well, in terms of linking up Austin and San Antonio on high-speed rail, uh, linking up Houston and Dallas, you know, and Monterey, Mexico, in terms of uh, alternatives to flying. Well, the thing, the thing cities, what, um, looking at Dallas and, and Houston, is what I've seen like that. Uh, is, is that, is that moving or practical in San Antonio? Uh, yes, it is doable and practical if we plan for it. Uh, right now, the densities on most of our arterial streets aren't really high enough to support um, a real heavy transit system, like in Dallas. Dallas had the same densities we did, and what they did is concentrate growth along stations in their first quarter going north out of downtown Dallas, and in the last 10 years, they've had $5 billion of private sector investment around those stations. They didn't have to impact the neighborhoods at all, but took a lot of traffic off the streets. 
So they've got a really pretty good model on that. Houston's taken another tack, basically taking what's a little enhanced streetcar, but it's not really as light rail as in Dallas, and moving that through their inner city neighborhoods. And, and block by block, as it extends, they're rehabbing little uh, stores, strip malls, and, and really changing the character of their inner city neighborhood that way. So the two real different approaches to transit in addition to cars. Uh, they're both successful, uh, in, at least if you gauge success in terms of improvements to neighborhoods, investment from the private sector, uh, and renovation and higher quality of life for people. Okay, take a look at your questions there. They're pretty straightforward. And um, when you're done in a few minutes, we'll start collecting them. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, recognize Dr. Finch, who's in the audience here, Calvin Finch. He's one of our, our key planning advisors who's working on our water issues uh, for the city, and uh, he's going to be a big participant in our planning program. Now that all of you, and you've got about a, a dozen tables here, have had a chance to think about your individual answers to these questions, and I'll share some of these with you in a few minutes, I'd like to hear from you, if you uh, from your different tables there, if any of you could sort of characterize what it is, or, or there's there any kind of theme that's emerged when you're thinking about this. Um, can you talk about, you could talk about that among yourselves for a few minutes, and then maybe one of you would have the uh, courage to stand up and say, here's what we think uh, is happening here, or, or, is it, or is it happening in San Antonio? We're, we're trying to anticipate the future, and we're trying to do it in a way it doesn't ruin all the good things we have here in the face of all this growth. And your district particularly is going to be impacted on I-10 and 1604 with all this growth. So what information, ideas, or themes that you could give us, uh, this, is, this is really useful. So why don't we just uh, think about, why don't you just talk about that amongst yourselves for a little bit. What do you think is the, the big challenge that's really affecting District 8? Because that's where you're all living. What is it that you would really like us to see happen and not happen in District 8? And let's see, you've got, you've got your individual opinions. Why don't you share those amongst yourself now for a little bit? In five minutes or so, we'll come back and just, just talk about it. So, share about what you think is going to happen here and what you don't want to have happen. I'm 
somebody is so excited. Right. Or somebody really is excited. Nobody gets excited. We certainly are leaders in some areas of water. Okay. Public input. Sorry, we can interrupt uh, these new discussions and address the tables, but we're going to need to move on. I know we can all talk here for an hour or two. So, let's just. Uh, Go around the room briefly, and then I'll read out some of the answers that, that y'all did individually. But let's talk about your group discussion we've just had. Uh, anybody at a table want to volunteer some ideas that uh, your your group was talking about? In the middle table here, to stand up, and I can repeat it if need be. Uh, we had a pretty lively discussion here, covered a, a number of topics, but the, some of the points right at the top of the discussion were the transportation, the ability to uh, the city might have to accommodate, uh, considering the growth that we're going to have, which is all going to be, looks like, heading up toward the north and northwest, to, to accommodate more local bus service, to service the communities uh, more easily so that you don't have to use your car everywhere, uh, make stops so uh, more like a, more like a, like seeing a big city where the buses stop every couple of blocks and you can get on and off and, and do your shopping and get back on and get home without having to use your car. That type of thing. Another thing that uh, we talked about was the consolidation of the school districts. And that's a biggie. With the growth, we have 18 school districts now. What are we going to have in uh, another uh, few years if we're going to uh, accommodate, try to accommodate another million people or so. Uh, so something needs to be done about the school district system that we have right uh, now. Uh, another vital and, and big point of discussion was the protection of the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, if we're going to have all that growth uh, and that they're projecting, I, I believe we will. Uh, something we talked about about protecting the water. Now there's a couple of other topics that I can't talk to you about because I'm not the origin, <laughs> but we have some other okay. people that I would like to talk about. Um, I would like to see, um, I guess my, the kind of, you know, I feel, but I really think the city needs to develop expertise at uh, neighborhood-based economic development. And that includes looking at um, our, I guess, more economically vulnerable neighborhoods. I think we need to actually bring in someone who is knowledgeable about studying the city's capacity for economic development like this. and. Um, at this kind of economic development also looks at the multiplier effect because all of this money stays not only in the city but in those neighborhoods and it becomes a market-based way of developing some of our poorer, um, you know, more vulnerable neighborhoods and bringing them uh, into vibrancy. Very good, thank you. All right, well, that was a productive table. Wow, we talked about uh, improving transit service, redoing the school districts, protecting the Edwards Aquifer and water, and promoting neighborhood at level economic development. That's great. And those are good ideas. And by the way, on that last topic, uh, we just finished a new study, which I just presented to council last week on market analysis of all the neighborhoods in San Antonio. So we're posting that on our website. Take a look. It's fascinating. The city's a real tapestry of neighborhoods that are and all different, every district has a whole range of neighborhoods ready to be um, redeveloped or developed with the private sector. All right, let's talk, well, an easier way to do this, let's just say anything at this table over here. Well, I think we focused on transportation uh, primarily, and, and uh, I guess two things that I would have mentioned, John, um, connectivity, uh, I'll give an example, uh, currently, 
there's of course the reconstruction of housing on the road that's not connecting where it should the I-10. I think that's unfortunate. That's not going to work sufficiently. That might have uh, work to tie into UTSA Boulevard. Uh, we also, I think, talked about uh, a less costly mass transit system, something besides rail, we think bus rapid transit's a really good system that can be done for about a quarter of the cost of the rail system. Uh, I think that's important. And, uh, we talked about, as a kind of micro scale issue, looking at a lot of free ride turns at intersections. So there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of our intersections to have free ride turns that would really help Okay, again, transportation, looking at BRT, bus rapid transit expansion, and uh, turning right more often. That sounds good, better than turning left more often. And yeah, I saw that in some of the written re responses. I'll get, I'll get to those in a minute. Okay, a table here in front, any comments? Can you all hear it? The concern about in, that police brigade becoming an inner city district as growth moves out. Can you clarify what an inner city is? We want to keep the environment safe and uh, police expansion was brought up but without the volunteerism of the public to go out and help. Uh, the expansion is not going to mean much. We need the citizens to be more concerned about what's going on around. As the chief said, that neighborhood uh, deal is very More important. citizen engagement to enhance what citizen police and community policing. When he says inner city, he's talking about King William or Jefferson or. Uh, what do you mean by King William? That's the question. Uh, the inner city. Inner city. Jefferson. Inner city is that uh, the na the people in the city just. Neglected, move out. Oh, I see. Dis disinvested neighborhoods. Yeah, we got to keep the people that live here staying in the district. Okay, so concern to to really keep the district strong, you got to people stay here and involved. Well, you certainly are. So that's great. Come here on Saturday afternoon. Okay, let's see this table over here. Any comments? Are these two tables on the right side? My right side. And we have other than those already expressed was what's going to happen uh, through the medical center in Wurzbach when Wurzbach Parkway finally gets open and the traffic flows all the way to 10 for about 35 over the speed. Yeah, so you'll be on the main east-west, the only east-west route between 1604 and 410 and what's the traffic going to be like over there? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. All right, any comments here at the center table? Keep the mission, uh, the Camp Bullets mission intact. So they don't, there's never a question as to whether they're going to leave or, you know, for that matter, all of the military bases here because they're a huge, they have a huge economic impact in our city, but it's also, you know, the military is in the USA. So. Very good point. Right. Yeah, and in fact, uh, we've just, you know, Camp Bullets just finished a big study. Um, and we have city has been beginning to implement those different uh, aspects of that city to protect the base. I have engaged the, the military here, all the bases, in terms of doing an overall plan for all the bases in, in Greater San Antonio, and they've agreed to do that. Uh, they have a big portion, a big play in our Pomperency plan in terms of the policies to protect the, the bases and all the economic activity that the bases engender, and almost 100,000 retirees here too. So the military is going to be a big part of the future 20 years, 30 years out, and, and certainly we're going to try to make them feel much more at home, even if they have in the past. Yes, that's a very good point. 
And uh, we're, that's one of the reasons we're doing this plan is we have better coordination between SAW, CPS, and the city's investment. In the past, that necessarily been quite in sync, and uh, now we're going to have them in sync. All right, any comments from the tables toward the back back there? It's there. Comments about the military. I'm actually here from the Army, and I remember <coughs> the, uh, the, the Association of Defense Communities, the Communities Winter Forum in, in 2008, and hearing uh, an SES, the equivalent of general officer, say, well, Camp Bullis just needs to close and Fort St. Houston will win it because it's so encroached to grow around. So hold on a minute, hold on a minute. We're going to do a joint land use study we did it in 2009, and we have addressed most of the problems. We're starting to see problems resurface again in some areas, but it's, it's manageable if we keep ahead of it. I think our table, our biggest dialogue was we see out in the I-10 area around Bullis, we see lots and lots of very large developments, the Crestabellas of the world, who come in and just basically level whole hillsides, uh, clear cut, and really change the nature of the hill country and really do strong impacts on, on Camp Bullis and Camp Stanley. And we wonder how the rough proportionality system works. You know, I-10, I've been working out of Camp Bullis, Camp Stanley, Fort Sam for 10 years now. My stand is so much worse for traffic. And it's, everyone knows that it's because of all those large developments out that way. I, are they paying anything towards I-10's upgrade with textile? I guarantee they're not. And, and rough proportionality needs to be looked at more in terms of fair share for their, what they're causing in terms of roads, flood control, and, and, and other impacts. Good point, and that's one of the reasons we've initiated an annexation the council has up that corridor because uh, we believe those, probably, those developments should be in the city and paying their fair share toward improvements in the future. Joint land use plan. Yeah. To, to preserve that area so their mission. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have. There, there's no plans to develop a square inch of Camp Villas and to protect it uh, as much as we can um, and not uh, have any kind of a development too close to it. So that's. Right. Right. Yeah, we'll be looking at that carefully. Okay, um, uh, we have a little time left, not much to answer a couple questions, maybe five minutes. Let me just see, I'm just going to take these at random, what people said for the four questions. And I thank you for your discussion and comments from your table. It's not easy to, you know, stand up and speak in public without any kind of preparation so but it's really useful for us because we just don't know okay here's a here's an answer uh, resident of I, eight, district eight what would the future be like look like in your district the i-10 corridor should be beautiful wherever possible since it's the primary entry into san antonio first impressions matter very good perspective wow that is one of the that is the main entrance you know from the west to the city the northwest um, I love the accessibility in, in District 8 to great shopping and medical facilities, good parks, and recreational areas. So you want to see, they want to see managed growth in the future through good zoning practices and good enforcement of the development code provisions. And transportation roads are, are congested, expansion of the airport, especially nonstop flights, is desired to major cities. So very good perspective from that person. Um, here's another one, continue to operate and grow prudently, great public schools and streets and neighborhoods that look excellent and are good cross-sections of our wonderful city's population. And they like neighborhoods like Elm Creek, public schools, excellent schools. We can grow, but we must assure that we provide for additional people. Um, what about District 8 do you love? The suburban atmosphere, the parks and the connectivity. They want more walking distance uh, communities, better traffic flows, safe and friendly neighborhoods, replace businesses and homes that are unoccupied and reduce north side growth. That's gonna be hard, but I'll try. Um, study major employers uh, and employees working in this area. Um, uh, preserve the feel of the neighborhoods. Annexation will be critical 
If without it, we will grow like Houston. Don't want that. Um, want wider streets, synchronized traffic lights, okay? Mixed use communities and more parks and green space. Bond projects to support the infrastructure and growth. Okay, that's whoever wrote those. These all all these are good, and all, everybody has an understanding, I think, of how the city works or doesn't work at this point. Growth of parks and linear parks, more walkable, less crime, water, power, and transportation is assured. Infrastructure along with adequate fire and police coverage, improved infrastructure, more and bigger parks, linear parks, commuter rail between UTSA and UTSA downtown. That would be interesting. No construction, though. Um, we have the opportunity to increase the density of our community. We can focus the growth inward. Um, we'd like to see the District 8 developed in a more orderly fashion, maintaining more green space, avoiding traffic congestion, overdevelopment, and lack of planning. Well, that will reduce the quality of life, unless it is, development is well regulated. Planned growth, mixed use, great areas for residential, commercial, and retail. Planned infill growth in light rail and high speed rail. Uh, mixed use with good transportation, high tech, solar power, parks and recreation, light rail, more parks and ride locations, and good secondary schools. So there's a sampling of what people thought. Um, you're all anticipating the future. You're all thinking about all the great things that we need here, and we're going to help you all pull this together in terms of this planning policy. As we move forward, we'll get to the point where we'll be actually giving you all chances to comment on the actual policy statements, which we'll be asking council to approve next year. And then I'll be packaged up in a snapshot and we'll call that the plan. But the plan is just the start, it's not the end. The plan is the beginning of a process, which we are really trying to foster here in San Antonio, of thinking about the future, anticipating the future, preparing for the future before it gets here too soon. And then everybody is surprised, like, oh, we can't move on the road, or this water is terrible, or the air quality, we can't breathe. I've been in cities that have had that situation, and they wish they hadn't. So this is our chance to try to head that off at the pass, so to speak. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoyed talking to you this afternoon. Thank you, John, and to the whole planning department for coming out and, and uh, making this piece of our presentation possible. Uh, I know they're going to make good use of your feedback as, it, as they start to uh, take the first steps in formulating this comprehensive plan. Uh, any long-range conversation about District 8 eventually winds up at uh, UTSA. As John said, it's a, a huge focal point. Uh, it has to be near the center of our planning, and no one is more qualified to talk about uh, UTSA, where it is now and where it's headed, than its current uh, student body president, uh, Zach Dunn. To the constituents, residents, and community leaders of District 8 and the greater San Antonio communities, and to all of you who are joining us here today, it is my sincere honor to introduce one of the greatest visionary leaders I have ever had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know our fearless leader, City Councilman Ron Nuremberg. <laughs> but before I delve into what makes City Councilman Ron Nuremberg such an inspiring leader, I'd like to first highlight his involvement with the University of Texas at San Antonio. Now, if you're from the university or you're involved there as a student, can you please raise your hand? Great representation. Thank you to you all for being here. Now, back when I first became student body president, it was the absolute priority of the Student Government Association to expand our community outreach and modify our external presence. This was two months before Ron Nuremberg came into office that this vision was really starting to take hold. But SGA, which is the Student Government Association, SGA and her members already had established a relationship with the councilman months before the celebratory watch party and many months before the district extended its tradition of resounding leadership to newly capable hands. Chris Stewart, are you in the room, sir? Chris Stewart was instrumental. Let's give a hand to Chris Stewart, please. Chris Stewart is an outstanding student leader at UTSA, and he was instrumental in forming that relationship. You see, something Councilman Nuremberg took the time to do in his campaign was employ students to engage other students. 
and he sees the vastly invaluable opportunity to really engage young people in this movement. Now, it's no secret that the youth of today are not as engaged in civic affairs as many would like them to be, but we are still the leaders, the innovators, and the change agents of the future. Councilman Nuremberg recognizes this fact, and on every single encounter I've ever had with him, he has made it a point to discuss ways we can collectively engage young people and show them the powerfully rewarding experience of getting involved with service to their community. But his service to the youth doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop after a few conversations of shakes with the hand. What I respect most about Councilman Nuremberg is his insatiable appetite to empower those around him to make change. Allow me to paint a small picture that really highlights this example. When my family and I visited the Dallas-Fort Worth area two summers ago, we visited a small town. And I don't exactly remember the name of the small town, but I do remember the street signs there. Street signs. They're, way, they're ways that people can, can find out where they're going and where they've been. They provide a clarity of purpose. But these street signs were different. They were painted purple and they had a horned frog on them. It was TCU country and no resident or visitor could be mistaken about that. So I came back to student government and we ran with the idea. We wanted to implement street signs in San Antonio that highlighted this city's leading institution. We wanted people, resident or visitor, to know that when they saw the street signs, they were in Roadrunner country. Now it's easier when everybody on your team, my team, was smarter than me and has equally great ideas that further the agenda that we set out at the very beginning. The exec board at the time, which includes Connor Harvey and Ileana Gonzalez, who now works for the councilman as an intern and is a current Miss UTSA, uh, they gave life to the idea and they informed the councilman of our intentions. Within a few months time, the greater UTSA community had street signs highlighting the university and one piece of our objective to really reach out to the community had been accomplished. None of that, absolutely none of that could have been accomplished without Councilman Nuremberg and his notoriously helpful staff. Now, it was a small change. It was a small ripple, but the possibility for change in the community was thus sent out. And with that ripple in mind, it's easy to see how the councilman has been able to serve as an inspiring leader to this city's residents. He's initiated the first coordinated water supply plan. He continues to try to find more jobs for our residents. He's working on transportation infrastructure. He's tackling, in my opinion, one of the city's most pressing issues, our water supply. He's founded the District 8 Community Academy. All of these accomplishments and services barely begin to the work, scratch the surface of the work he does for our community each and every single day. But you know what's better than all of that? You know what makes Ron Nuremberg, city councilman for District 8 in San Antonio special? His connection to the people. Never in my life did I think I'd actually meet a city councilman. Never did I think I'd be able to call one my friend. And never did I think that this community would be luckier to have them as their representative than we all know now him to be. And that is the effect that City Councilman Ron Nuremberg has on every single person that he meets. He believes that everybody should have access to the very best opportunities in life, and he believes that on a daily basis. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our leader and City Councilman, Mr. Ron Nuremberg. I need to bottle that up and use it for my next introduction. Zach, I appreciate that. Um, I'm Ron Nuremberg, uh, and raise your hand. Uh, I know the UTSA students here, but raise your hand if you wish you were 22 again. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be introduced by somebody like Zach Dunn, because in many ways, he exemplifies why we should feel good about the future of San Antonio. And I know that's what we've been talking about here today is, is all the things that we're going to be doing in the future of San Antonio, why it requires a great deal of work from all of us. Um, Zach mentioned how we are making a concerted effort to put students in San Antonio into leadership positions within my office. Um, and that's because, number one, they're energetic. You just saw that. Uh, number two, they have great ideas. But number three, all of us are going to be depending on their leadership one way or the other in the future. So we may be as removed as possible from the UTSA campus, we may be removed as possible from being 22 again, uh, but one way or the other, we are gonna depend on them being active and engaged in the leadership in the future of San Antonio. So it's a great honor to be doing things like the Community Academy, which has just, by the way, received con a congressional award for some of the innovative techniques that we're using to reach out in the community and inspire 
uh, new civic participation. Many of you are engaged in the, in the community academy, and that's basically proactive constituent services. It's about us bringing the district aid office to you rather than you having to come to us when there are issues. A community academy does things like uh, block walks to let people know what, what's going on in the community. Let us know, let them know how to get a hold of us, how to call us and email us. Let's us know and find out where the problems in the streets are, where their potholes need to be fixed. We're doing town halls every month where many of you have come and talked about issues that are concerning you. We do kids town halls with eight and nine and 10 and, and on up young people to let them know that their government is also listening to them. You see, because it's not just someone's right to vote that makes what we do in council and the rest of government that's important. In fact, many times, what we do with the people who can't yet vote, the young people, uh, determines how successful a city will be in the future. The Kids Town Halls, by the way, are resulting in some real action that's a benefit to all of you. In fact, two weeks ago or three weeks ago now, we went over to Hector Garcia Middle School, and I think some of you live in that area, but we, we heard during that town hall some really important concerns about infrastructure from the school, uh, dangerous intersections, things like that, missing missing stop signs or places where signalization could be improved. And we've asked those students now to make their presentation at TCI. So I know there's some TCI folks. We're having a meeting on, on Friday at City Hall. About 12 young people are going to come down and make their presentations to our city staff about why it's important to improve certain intersections and things like that. And, and we can make those, those presentations all day long, but when you hear about it from a nine-year-old, it makes it much more important, it makes it much more salient while we're doing these things for the, fu for the future. So our future and, and the things that these students are doing is about human capital. We want to ta tap into those ideas and those important, uh, the energy that they bring. But it's also about our economic future. In fact, the reason, one of the reasons why I think you should care about our work with UTSA is they're in hot pursuit of this ephemeral thing called tier one status. It's not a box that you can check off immediately, but it has to do with building a great campus, building a great campus community, making sure that we have the intellectual uh, capacity that is building within the university among the students as well as the faculty that we can begin to create a great future no matter where we are in the city. And it has real dollars and cents impact on cities around the country that have tier one institutions attached to them. They're able to lure more businesses because they have research capabilities that wouldn't otherwise have. They also attract the best and the brightest from around the world. In fact, we are on our way there through some concerted effort through UTSA. They already make a $1.2 billion impact on the city of San Antonio annually. That's the impact from having UTSA be a strong university. And so that will only increase as we continue to build the profile of UTSA. In addition, they employ 15,000 San Antonians that's 15,000 San Antonio families that are able to get to and from work uh, in a reasonable way and contribute to our economy. And they also graduate more students. UTSA graduates more students today than any other South Texas university uh, around. And that says a lot to a former commuter campus that was built among all the cow pastures in Northwest San Antonio. It's an extraordinary story, and it's one that I'm happy to tell, and we're doing things already on the campus and outside of campus. In fact, Zach and I celebrated the opening of the B-Cycle program, a bike share program that helps take cars that you're stuck in traffic with off the road so students can get around campus without using a car, also a little safer. Uh, it helps them stay healthy, avoid the freshman 15. Uh, and it's also a great story for San Antonio to be able to tell other students that, hey, this is what our great campus is doing. In addition to that, we've also asked, my office initiated something called the University Overlay Zone. So many of you live around the campus, and over the last 15, 20 years, that campus has sprawled. You've seen frat parties in your neighborhoods, probably. You've seen the negative effects of having a sprawling place around your neighborhood. We're trying to help encourage the growth of UTSA and see, help you see the positive so we've asked for university overlay zones to help organize the growth around the university, make it a friendly university for the students on campus and the faculty and the staff, but also help focus that growth so it doesn't bleed over into other areas. There's, a, there's an important reason to have great university campuses for students. 
And then, and then by doing that, we can also make sure that we maintain and protect the integrity of the neighborhoods around there. So that's all about planning land use better. And we can do that in microcosm through the UTSA campus. <clears throat> but what you've done here today, which I thank you for being here and participating, what you're doing today is far bigger than that. This is about the future of San Antonio. It's about the comprehensive plan. And we know what happens if we don't plan. We see that all around us. Uh, it's one of the reasons why in a city that sprawls as much as we, we have, that we're finding difficulty paying for roads, we have challenges maintaining services at times, and that's because the farther we get away from infill and core development, the harder it is to maintain those things. So the comprehensive plan, for me, is one of the biggest challenges that we will face as a community. And I have to tell you, I was at a, I was at a candidate forum this morning, and one of the questions was, what are your top three priorities as a city councilman? And I can name them, water, transportation, and jobs, rolls off the tongue, as it should, but the reality is the priorities are much greater than that. Um, you know, through our office, and there are great folks that work for our office, in fact, the best folks, in my opinion, in the city, how <coughs> dense the work is. There is not a topic that we don't interact with that isn't a priority for the city, but it does all revolve around one thing for me, and that's growth. You heard the statistics from Cheryl and John. Over the next 25 years, this city will have another 1.1 million people living in. And that's conservative estimates from the state demographer's office. We should have another 500,000 cars on the road. We will also be doubling in population in the next 35 years. And you know what San Antonio looks like, or excuse me, where District 8 looks like today. Our city over 2000, 2010, the census grew by 33%. That's twice as fast as the rest of the city of San Antonio. So everything that you're feeling in San Antonio about the growth, the growth factor is felt almost twofold here in the city, in, in District 8. Now the purpose of this plan, and we've seen plans before, we have the master, master transportation plan, we have the North Sector plan, we've got the uh, parks plan, we've got, you name it, we have a plan for it. But what is undeniably true about you, most of those plans is they sit on the shelf and they collect dust. And I've, and I've seen many, I've seen many, uh, Sorry, just calling me. I've seen many plans on my own shelf that the pages aren't even cracked yet. What we don't want to have happen with this comprehensive plan is make it about the product and not about the process. The real strength of this plan is that we're going to start engaging community, engaging our citizens so that they're directing it. Just like the SA2020 process created a vision for the city near term, what we're trying to do is create a roadmap of how to get there. And by 2019, when, when uh, who knows, uh, Secretary Castro comes down and he's cutting a ribbon on something that, that we started because of the SA 2020 process. That plan hopefully will be outdated. What we don't want to have happen with this comprehensive plan is that we, we look at it and we think that it's, it's done. So we are engaging in a public process that allows us to direct the plan, that allows us to update the plan when necessary, and it's going to require all of your input. In that way, it's publicly owned and it outlasts any of us elected officials. That's the important part. This planning process, and I'm proud to chair the Comprehensive Planning Committee, if we do it right, we'll have nothing to do with Mayor Taylor, myself, or any of the other council members. It's really gonna be about what the public wants the city to look like in 30, 40, 50 years. And when 30, 40, 50 years comes, we still have a process in place to continue to plan for the future. Um, I do wanna make mention of two people who had to leave and one of the reasons why I'm so focused on the future, and that was my son Jonah, who's six, and my wife Erica. Uh, the work is pretty tough, but when we have people that inspire us to look beyond our own, our own little uh, circle of the day, um, it helps us quite a bit. So I wanted to make mention of them. I also wanted to, to mention to you our whole political process, and you notice this from the federal government to the local government, is built around incident gratification. Um, the reason why it's important for me to have students here and to have us talk about planning and to actually do planning at these State of the District events is to tell you that everything we're doing right here today, if we do it right, you won't get any credit for it. You won't get any credit for it because what we're planning for is the future down the road. And I promise that to my son Jonah. When, he comes up, when I come home late at night and I'm tucking him in as the first thing I do when I get home, uh, he asks me, did I make the world better? And I tell him, I think so but you have to tell me when, when you're my age. 
So I think that's the stuff that we're working on. And John mentioned the components of the plan. They're very important, uh, but they're all integrated. The, the comp plan itself, the sustainability plan, the transportation plan, we need to be working on all those things. But I do want to touch on one, which is the comprehensive water plan. The Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas recently cited in December of 2013, water scarcity is the number one concern for economic security in San Antonio and for the rest of Texas. So we've been working very hard to shore that up. You know in the city of San Antonio that has been a very big challenge for us over the last 40, 50 years. In fact, 400 years ago, this city was settled over the Edwards Aquifer. And you all know the Edwards Aquifer. A clean, abundant, plentiful water source that comes up out of the ground without any pumping. It's the reason why San Antonio water system prices are some, among the, some of the lowest in the nation. But this area is growing fast, and the climate is getting more arid. And so we have to plan for the future. And cities around the country, in fact, around Texas, are having to plan for that future as well. And that's where we come up with the saying, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting in Texas. But I'm happy to say that my office has been working very closely on this. We've been working hard to with San Antonio Water System, which has done a great job. We recently passed the, uh, the pipeline project, which is a very controversial project, but that is the single largest most ambitious water supply diversification effort in the history of San Antonio. It took a lot of courage to cast a vote, and it's going to take a lot of work to get it right. It's not a done deal. But we have to continue to work to make sure it's a done deal because in 20 years from now, in 30 years from now, our long-term water management plan shows gaps in the supply. And when we're trying to lower jobs for those 1.1 million people that will live here, we need to make sure that companies, when they move here, companies, when they expand here, don't have a want for water. But it's not just about expanding supplies. It's not just about diversification. It's also about conservation. It's about uh, reuse and recycled water, which those are things that SAWS is doing very, very well. And it's also about protecting the Edwards Aquifer. And that's the one area of this plan that I'm most concerned with and I've been working most hardest on which is the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. Over the last uh, 15 years, the San Antonio, citizens of San Antonio have protected 130,000 acres of the recharge zone. That has protected the equivalent of 36 billion gallons of water annually. That's half the water we will need to draw from the Edwards Aquifer in the year 2060. So when we're working on water supply, we're working on water security, what we need to do is make sure we get our basics. In 2060, if we continue to diversify, we continue to bring those uh, regional water sources on, we continue to get better at recycling, half of, two thirds of our water, excuse me, two thirds of our water will still come from the Edwards Aquifer. So if we hope to have clean water, we hope to have abundant water, we need to make sure we, we protect the Edwards Aquifer. And, and that's why Councilman Lopez and I worked very hard to get back on the ballot for you. And on May 9th, I'm not going to, this is not a political event, but I can ask you this because it's not about me. On May 9th, please vote to support the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. It is the most important initiative, and by the way, one of the most popular initiatives the city has ever undertaken. And, and for those of you who have followed uh, some of the uh, more fun uh, episodes in council, in my opinion, one of them was about bats over the last year. Anyone heard of the Bracken Bat Cave? Yeah. Well, this was a major political challenge for us. In fact, uh, that particular piece of property sits over one of the most sensitive regions of the Edwards Aquifer. It happened to also be in Comal County, uh, in political no man's land, because also in Comal County, it was part of the San Antonio Extraterritorial Jurisdiction. This, for all practical purposes, had no leadership whatsoever in that area of the community, but it had every bit of importance to the city of San Antonio. It was through that Edwards Aquifer Protection Program that we were able to ante up to the table, get a regional partnership created that allowed San Antonio to protect probably the largest piece of land over the Edwards Aquifer that we needed to protect. So um, just keep that in mind. Things like that, leveraged opportunities with the Edwards Aquifer Program are possible and they're very important for us to do. So let me talk about um, the other part of the May 9th vote that I think is also important. This is the Linear Creekway Park System. Um, you all know it. It's connected, actually, very close here at the Hardburger Park. The Linear Creekway System was envisioned by Howard Peake uh, back in the early 
2000, actually before that, the late 90s, as an emerald ring of parks, linear parks around the city of San Antonio. Since then, just like the Edwards Aqua Protection Program, we've been taking an eighth of our scented sales tax over the last 15 years and protecting pieces of land to create an emerald ring of parks around the community. <coughs> Since then, we've protected and, and created 46 miles, linear miles of parkways. We have another 40 under development. And the, envision, the vision itself had 130 miles uh, creating that ring around the city. So we're well on our way. But we also need to continue the program. So Councilman Lopez and I and the rest of City Council voted to put it back on the balance so we have the opportunity to protect it again. Uh, this quickly is becoming one of those additional reasons why people want to move to San Antonio, why people want to bring their business to San Antonio. So it's a critical thing for us, not just for protecting open space and green space, but it's a critical thing for us to help uh, with economic development and quality of life in San Antonio. So I'm happy to champion it, and I'm happy uh, to ask you to support it uh, in May. One other part of that, though, is as we continue to build this international brand uh, for the Linear Creekway system, and we want people to know that we have one, and we want people to use it, and we want people to increasingly use it for mobility purposes, to move around places rather than using their cars or, or uh, you know, something else. Um, we need them to know that it's safe. So I've asked this last week, and I have uh, talked with our San Antonio Police Department, and Parks Department, and with city staff, as well as uh, advisory board members. We've asked now for a comprehensive strategy to protect safety infrastructure in, in the Linear Creekway system. Develop safety infrastructure along the Linear Creekway so that as we build this park system, we're also building and integrating a safety infrastructure. I'm not sure what that looks like. Um, that's why we've asked to have our, our board members participate in the plan to have citizen input. Uh, but what we want to do is make sure that no one has any doubt that when they enter the world-class Power WP Greenway Trail system, they're also going to be safe and they're going to be able to use it and allow their family and children to use it as well. So that's a, that's a very important initiative that's coming online for our park system. The other part of our park system, the jewel of our park system on the north side, you're sitting in right now. And I'm very proud to have championed an effort in the last budget cycle to find additional room to continue the, park, the, uh, the trailways or the trails inside Hardberger Park. Uh, to the tune of uh, $2 million over the next two years, we're going to continue to improve this area of land, which has become a world class park. In fact, Chuck is here. He can show you a map that he has pinned different locations of where people are coming from to come to our park. Uh, it's an amazing thing, this, this park here in San Antonio, and I know there's probably a number of you who have moved into this area just because of this park. And you know it's disconnected too, right? Uh, this is actually two pieces of distinct property, or actually it was one homestead, but it's two pieces of property now that's cut right down the middle by Horstock Parkway. Uh, we have a design, and Chuck would be happy to talk to you about it, to create a land bridge over this park. Sounds, uh, sounds interesting. But I can tell you that if you look at this design and the innovation that it would bring to San Antonio, it would be a, a bridge over Wurzbach Parkway that's about a football field wide. It would be for pedestrians to walk over. It would be for wildlife to walk over. It would be for us to connect the two sides of the park. It would quickly become one of the two or three or four top icons of our city. It would be a, a land bridge, the first of its kind in the United States and among, among a very, very few in the world. And I do hope you come to learn about it and you uh, ask about it and I hope to earn your support to uh, make that project happen. You guys are a little warm in here. Um, I am too, so apologize if I'm sweating. The other part of this plan, the transportation piece, I know is the one that, that's got most people hot, speaking of hot. Um, the reality is nothing we do in transportation gets done alone anymore. We're working hard with the city management to identify dollars to uh, make our IMP plan, our infrastructure maintenance plan dynamic. So when neighbors at these tables here identify different issues that they're having in the neighborhood, we can move things around. Every one of our city-owned streets is on a five-year rolling plan, and our sidewalks as well. And whenever there's issues, we can go in on that five-year plan and make sure that the streets are getting resurfaced or repaired as necessary. 
When we hear from you, we help move things around as necessary. But remember, every bit of problem that you're having in your neighborhood, we're experiencing all around the city. And that's why I bring up the challenge with transportation. With 1.1 million people moving here, with buying power from our highway dollars uh, declining to about 50% what they were in the mid-90s at the state and the federal level, uh, with every project that we do, we do becoming much more stretched because of the growth of San Antonio, it has become a challenge. And if you look at every model uh, of transportation growth and transportation need in the city of San Antonio and throughout the state of Texas, it is a dire situation. And I'm here to tell you that it's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better until we start changing our thinking. Um, we need to start planning our transportation system better in a more multimodal strategic capacity, and that's what this comprehensive plan is meant to do. But we do know we need to have some immediate relief here in town. And I want to tell you through the leadership of Councilman Reed Williams, who preceded me, we took our leadership and we took our, our community, we brought them together, uh, through the bond program, we prioritize a triage list of roadways in District A. And I can tell you, if you've experienced it as well, east and west travel along any road in District A has become a challenge, getting to it from I-10. We have a triage that includes roads like De Zavala, Peru, Hebner, um, Hausman Road, which is getting done, UTSA Boulevard, which is getting done. All these roadways have become a challenge, but we're working on them, uh, and we're working on them very quickly. On days of all improve, we know the saga that was behind that. We are identifying pre-construction dollars, and it's my hope. And I'm going to be championing, and by the time we get together again next year, hopefully, uh, God willing, that I will be able to tell you and ask for your support for uh, prioritizing Crew Road. Yes. Because that roadway, next to days of all and Hausman Road, are absolutely uh, locked up experiencing major drainage problems, and uh, experiencing heavy growth along those corridors. So it's my hope that with identifying pre-construction dollars, which we have in Days of Allah and in Peru Road, we will be able to get both of those roads done finally. Everybody doing okay? You want to stand up or anything? Please, please do that. Um, so on, on the note of uh, focusing transportation dollars, that's all very important, but it also brings up one of the more serious discussions we're having here at the city of San Antonio, and that is our bond rating. As we talked about last year, San Antonio is one of the last big cities with a AAA bond rating. What does that mean? Well, I mean, it, for some it may be window addressing, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. Uh, we got uh, our ratings back from, this, from the rating agencies. All three have, them up, have us at the highest level, which is great, uh, because if you look at financial ratings, a notch or two decline in our rating impacts our buying power to an extent that we would actually lose the buying power of the entire house in the road. So it's very important that we maintain our financial strength, our financial ratings, and so we're budgeting around that priority. We are the last remaining big city in the country with a AAA bond rating from all agencies, and we're very proud to continue that. And in this last cycle, though, the rating agency Moody's actually gave us a, a warning. And that is not, not for anybody's fault. This is things that are happening around us. These are things that are happening around the country, including the Governmental Accounting Standards Board re reshuffling their priorities, making sure that cities are taking care of their infrastructure as well as budgeting properly. This all brings up the other serious discussion that we're, we're talking about in the city of San Antonio, which is collective bargaining. And I'm not here to offer a proposal not off, here to offer or characterize what's happening with the negotiations other than to say my role as a city councilman is to establish the policy parameters of a discussion and what we did in june of 2014 which is when we had our goal setting session is that we as a council decided that at maximum we need to have one third or at minimum we need to have one third of our city budget go towards all the other services that that are required by our, our citizens, which include libraries, parks, um, infrastructure, maintenance, things like that. So my job as a city council is to make sure that we have those parameters, that we stick to them, and we have our, our uh, negotiators go out and get us a deal. I can tell you what we aren't talking about in our collective bargaining situation. We are not talking about line of duty benefits. We're not talking about pension benefits. We are simply talking about the cost day to day 
of public safety. And I am very encouraged about what I've heard happen uh, at the negotiating table yesterday. We still have a lot of progress to be made, but in my estimation, if we all work and we stay in our lanes and we make sure that we're sticking to our, our goals, uh, we will be able to get a deal done. And that's my, that's my hope. And at no time uh, have I ever felt that uh, we need to do anything other than uh, be getting a deal. So um, I'm very pleased with the progress I've heard about. I do think it's a pretty dire situation, um, but I do believe we can get a deal done. And, and really, I guess the last point I'll make about that is that the reality of this situation is that long term, we need to make sure we contain costs in any single department. And when we find uh, trends that are out of line, we need to make sure we contain them, whether they're in public safety or any other place. So let me talk about um, a couple other things. One of them is innovation. You heard about the Uber and Lyft debate. Um, you know where I stand on the Uber and Lyft debate. Um, what I would say is that the rideshare debate is about a lot of things. But first and foremost, it's about whether or not San Antonio is ready for our future. So I've, enc I've been encouraged also that we are uh, working on a good agreement to keep those companies in town. I'm also encouraged by the fact that um, we are working on innovation in other areas in San Antonio. You all have heard about Google Fiber. Google Fiber is a broadband service that hopefully is coming to San Antonio. We, we saw some of the action that's happening around the rest of the city, or around the rest of the country, but I can tell you that San Antonio is making real progress in getting Google Fiber, or getting AT&T uh, high-speed service, and getting Time Warner and so forth. We are making good progress on creating a comprehensive plan for digital infrastructure in San Antonio. Um, what that means is, in the next 20, 30, 40 years, just as uh, electrical and water utility infrastructure was 100 years ago, we are going to see digital infrastructure, digital information infrastructure, uh, be as important to our economy as, as those things were to separate uh, communities that had and communities that had not back then. So we've been working to get a comprehensive digital infrastructure plan integrated within our comprehensive plan. I'd be happy to talk with you more about that as we move along. But it's about making sure that every home and business has had access to the information infrastructure and making sure that we have uh, infrastructure in place that can meet our capacity demands while also uh, ensuring that the city has a voice in how that infrastructure is created. And finally, let me talk a little bit about um, economic development. 30 or 40 years ago in San Antonio, we were known as a, a solid economy that was based on mainly a couple of industries, military and tourism. Over the last several decades, we've been diversifying into areas such as information technology, financial services, medical, and so forth. And I'm very happy with what's going on here in, in the District A. In fact, uh, about a month ago, we secured an agreement with the largest financial services institution in Texas, Security Service Federal Credit Union, to retain 700 jobs and also to, to uh, create new, 200 new jobs here in San Antonio. They're going to contribute another $10 million to infrastructure uh, in a very key part of the I-10 corridor. That's important because it's, it's bringing, again, important employment for the future of San Antonio. It's also important because it's showing that we're ready to work with these folks. Um, in addition to that, over in the medical center, we've seen a lot of work done. And, and Jim, thank you for being here. Um, one of our growth centers in the city of San Antonio, one of the places that we'll rely on uh, to continue to fuel the economy is the medical center. We employ over 50,000 people in the medical center from all industries, and we believe that with the next uh, 25 years of growth in San Antonio, we expect that that um, employment base to nearly double. So we've been working with the Medical Center Alliance and with the San Antonio Medical Foundation to integrate the San Antonio's, San Antonio's Capital Improvement Plan with uh, the master plan for the medical center so that we can let we can work together to build better infrastructure and attract major uh, research institutions and, and new jobs to to the medical center. We're also doing that to ensure that pedestrians and vehicles, patients, employees have safe access into and out of the medical center. And then finally with the biomedical industry that's 
in the medical center, we are working to ensure that we are capturing uh, all the growth and innovation potential that's in the medical center and in the biomedical area in particular. We've had several new jobs, uh, excuse me, several new companies created in the biomedical space in the last uh, two years. Uh, we are working hard to invest uh, in those companies that will grow and build jobs in the city of San Antonio. And we're also seeing that realized in, in the profile of San Antonio being raised. Just this last December, we had the World Stem Cell Summit here in San Antonio, which brought innovators and scientists and researchers from around the country here to our city to examine how they can collaborate and how they can work with our medical professionals in, in San Antonio. So it was a great win for us all. Uh, and the biomedical space in particular uh, is a strategic investment that we, we plan to grow and, and we have uh, a tremendous amount of opportunity to be built from. So in, in closing, I just want to make mention first, thank you again for being here to plan with us. The comprehensive plan will continue to be rolled out and we'll be continuing to work with you to uh, make sure that it's a good plan and that we have, it to have a good process to continue to build from. But I also want to thank you and my team for being here. It is, I say often, and I think many of you experience, that we have a, just one of the best group of people working for District 8 that one could ask for. So I do want to make mention of, of Connor Harvey, who is one of our interns, as well as Hudson Kyle, who is our Director of Communication. Uh, TJ Mays in the back there, who is our Chief of Staff. Eloy, um, Eloy is here, he's our District Chief. Um, Please get to know them. Coda Rail Garza who handles all of our, our land use and planning. And then of course, Jackie Bolds, who is our office, office director, and Alice Aguirre, who handles everything that uh, our office does. Uh, please get to know them. We are working hard for you. We are working hard for the future of San Antonio. We, we thank you dearly for being part of it.